Cry of Fear is a masterclass in survival horror. In regards to the scariest games I've played, it's right near the top of that list. I feel like a thief playing it. Why? Because it's free. A small group of passionate developers from Sweden put out a title that outclasses all but the very best the genre has to offer. It takes heavy influence from horror titans like Silent Hill, but gives it its own unique twist. It does have a few drawbacks, like its over-reliance on jump scares, but the pros outweigh the cons by a wide margin. This is my first time playing Cry of Fear, and throughout I kept thinking to myself, why didn't I play this sooner? So let's dive into the world of Cry of Fear. To note for this video, I'll only be covering the main campaign and not the co-op campaign. In Cry of Fear, we play as Simon, a young man, a troubled young man full of loneliness. Heading home, he comes across an injured man. A car hits Simon as he's examining the man. What follows is a surreal scene of navigating through black hallways with a camera. We'll encounter one of the game's more noble jump scares. Don't worry, I won't play this one. I have more to say about the use of jump scares later. Simon awakes in an alley. With no phone credit and a text message from mom to come home, Simon's quest begins. What a horrible night, although there are no curses to speak of. Here, Simon's quest is one of the darkest, bleakest you'll come across in the game. One reason Cry of Fear delivers its horror so well is its atmosphere, unrelenting and overbearing for long stretches, but also knows when to dial it back, to give you a bit of breathing room, to reflect on what happened. The music does a wonderful job on both ends, filling you with terror and some sections with temporary relief in others. The sound design is just as good. The amount of unsettling sounds you'll hear out of sight will be a constant source of anxiety. There's a tightrope you must walk to get pacing right. Have stretches of horror that are too long and you'll wear the player out. Have relief sections too often or too long and player loses that fear. Cry of Fear has a near perfect balance. He knows when to dial back, but never to the point where the player loses that sense of dread. The influence of Silent Hill is clear throughout, from sections resembling the other world, the apartment section, and rowing a boat across the lake. Hey, if you're going to take heavy influence, might as well pull from the best. As far as its atmosphere goes, other comparisons I'd make would be with the Condemned and Manhunt games. Some due to the environment, some due to the combat, and some due to the dark tone of its story. Bleak, dark, horrific. Speaking of horrific, let's talk about the monsters. Cry of Fear is one of the best monster rosters in the game I've played. A common issue I have with horror titles is their small enemy roster. Most overstay their welcome by the time the credits roll. Cry of Fear is not one of them. There is a staggering number of enemy types, all with their own distinct looks, sounds, and attack patterns. Some highlights include the faster, the woman with blades for arms. Her death cries are some of the most unsettling around. <laughs> There are these Michael Myers lookalikes who have this frantic pace in how they'll descend upon you. Another enemy highlight is Crazy Runner. Not difficult enemies, but their panic breathing upon spotting you induce panic. Another is a stranger, the one with a book for a head. A Facebook, if you will. They use telepathy damage that can kill you in a quick manner if you're not careful. They only make a few appearances, but very much a no crap when they appear. Another is the drowned. Stare at them for too long and they'll take control of Simon, in which you have to resist their control, else it's game over. <laughs> Some enemies appear only for a short stretch. Others drop in and out throughout the game. Cry Fear makes great use of darkness, the low polygon count, and enemy movement for horror. Enemies shuffle at a rapid speed through the dark and are up in your face before you know it. Due to the limited light, you don't have much time to process their look, to take it in before you kill them off at a frantic pace. The fear of the unknown is always the greatest fear. Developers of Cry Fear understood this and made incredible use of it. In regards to polygons, Cry Fear makes use of the Gold Source engine, the engine Valve created prior to Source. Why did the devs make use of Gold Source despite the availability of Source? They were more familiar with it. There were plans for a remake in the Source engine, but scrapped it. They showed a decent chunk of footage. Looks fantastic. Oh 
There's something about games made in the gold source and source engine. A je ne sais quoi factor. One I notice more in source, but still noticeable in gold source. That being a sense of loneliness. There are many videos on YouTube on the subject of why source engine titles feel lonely. In a game where loneliness is so prominent, it adds to the atmosphere. It's incredible to see what they are able to push the gold source engine to do. I also think using the hammer editor to create levels plays a factor. A fitting name for whenever I try it out, I'd want to smash my keyboard with a hammer. If you get put up with hammer editor, you're some dedicated sons of bitches. Jump scares is something I'm more mixed on in Cry of Fear. Some jump scares are some of the best I've come across in the game. There was always that anticipation. I found myself leaning away from the screen on the regular. That said, it does feel like they went to the jump scare well a bit too often, especially in the early game. It's something that eases up as the game progresses, and it's better for it. For example, in the apartment section, there are many enemy breaks the door down jump scares that get tiresome and draining to deal with. Your mileage may vary with jump scares, but I found Cry of Fear went to the well a bit too often. With the way you descend ladders, I was always on edge waiting for a ladder jump scare, one akin to fear. If you played Fear, you know which one I'm talking about. But they never do. Well, that's not exactly true. There's one with a breaking ladder that threw me for a loop. As far as gameplay goes, Cry of Fear has among the best for a survival horror title. There are many limitations in place that we have to deal with, many in which I'm surprised other games haven't made use of. One example being losing your entire magazine while reloading. By force of habit, I was dropping a decent chunk of ammo in the early game. That habit of always reloading took a while to get over. Which leads to some great decision making. You may have a few bullets ready to go. Is it better to reload now and drop those bullets in case what's around the corner is too much? It's rare to see other games make use of this feature. I Divine Cybermancy is one of them. Off the top of my head, I can't think of a survival horror game that makes use of this approach, which surprises me. Resource management is key to survival horror. Adding this feature would do wonders for decision making. And the way the system interacts with others is brilliant, one being the lighting system. Cry Fear makes brilliant use of lighting. Some of the best I've come across in a game. It's a dark game. Without a source of light, you'll only be able to see a short distance in front of you. Not good when you have enemies barreling down on you on the regular. But you do have access to light sources, like your cell phone. It gives only enough light to see what's ahead. Plus, you always have the current text on display, a nice reminder of what's expected of you. Using the phone comes at a cost, that using one of your hands. You could use a melee weapon or one-handed gun in the other. You can't use a two-handed gun at the same time. And even using it with a one-handed gun has drawbacks, like lower accuracy and you can't reload unless you put the phone away. Remember earlier when I said you have to consider with some guns if you want to reload now or drop the rest of the magazine? This is a great example. Reload now and lose some bullets, but there's less of a chance you'll need to switch off your light and reload should the need arise. It's another system that adds so much to the Cry of Fear experience. It's a wonderful constraint. If you explore thoroughly, you can find a light mounted for your gun, but it's only for the weakest gun. One of the game's best stretches is when you get the message of the low battery on your phone, the sense of imposing doom invoked, and then your phone dying. From there, we have a stretch involving flares in the maze-like section. You have a limited amount and a limited time before they burn out. Only enough to see a short distance ahead, but not enough to be comfortable. I was on the edge of my seat the whole time during this portion. Cry Fear makes use of limited inventory. Only six slots. No spot for ammo, that collects on its own. Everything else takes up a slot. There are no item boxes, so you have to drop an item to free up a slot. I've seen complaints from others about Cry Fear that key shouldn't be taking up the same size of a slot as a gun. Fair enough, but have you played the classic Resident Evil games? That's how it works. There are points where you have to pick up key items to progress, which will push your decision making on what items you'll drop in the meantime. Keep the better gun with lower ammo or the weaker gun with more ammo. These are choices you're always making. Cry Fear isn't afraid to kick your ass, even on the default difficulty. Outside of the Soul series, I can't think of a game that gave me great relief upon finding a save point. Another system of constraints is the stamina system, one I'm more mixed on. Cry Fear offers a dodge ability, something handy in combat, especially early on when you're stuck with melee weapons. Although it turns into a swipe, dodge, rinse, and repeat, you have to keep an eye on your stamina as it will deplete. The last thing you want happening in combat is running out of it. I like how to get better aim with your rifle, you can hold your breath at the cost of stamina. <laughs> The issue I have with the stamina system is how it's tied to jumping. A jump will deplete your bar. Which makes sense. It's not an issue for a large part of the game. Except for one section, that damn train escape. This is one of those what were they thinking moments that's interesting in idea but lacking in execution. Something that should remain on the cutting room floor. You have to make use of the crouch jump, a mechanic that pops up in various games. One of those odd quirks you'll find in the gold source and source engine titles. The problem arises in the train escape due to how tight the space is. It's very easy to miss the jump. 
You get frustrated and try again, and again, before you know it, you've depleted your energy meter. Had the game not have your jump tied to energy, this section would have been much less frustrating, or better yet, not in the game at all. To be fair, I've never been a big fan of the crouch jump. Of course, if crouch jumping never existed, one of Darkseid Field's finest moments would have never happened. How are people able to jump up here? Look, I can't jump up here. It doesn't make sense. This game has a bugged jumping mechanic. What you need to do is jump and while you're jumping, crouch. And if you crouch while you're jumping, you can actually do jumps. Backtracking and looping back to past areas is part of the level design of Cry of Fear. A bold design choice is not having a conventional map that you could access at all times. There are maps you could find at the bus stops or the train stations, but these only give a general idea of where you are. It's up to you of where to recall of where you need to go next. With some excellent use of lighting and guidance from signs, the game gives enough trust to the players to find their way around. With that, let's go through some of the notable moments of Cry of Fear's campaign, so spoilers ahead. One key element to any horror title is the build up to the first encounter. Cry of Fear gives us time to get used to our surroundings. These lonely streets are based off Stockholm, Sweden. We get a couple of glimpses of distant figures before our first encounter. For now, we're stuck with a melee weapon, so we make use of the back and forth dodging while taking a swipe in these narrow halls. We'll reach the apartment where we'll spend a decent chunk of the game, one which we revisit later. We get a text message from someone inside, giving us a destination. I love the use of the cell phone for this. As we're short on light, you're going to be using it very often. It always reminds you of where you need to go, but also for building that dread. As great as this section is, as I mentioned earlier, I found it to be too jump scare heavy of enemies breaking down doors barreling down on us. It does cap off with a decent, if unremarkable, boss fight, a long match of dodging and whittling down their health. After the fight, we meet the Doctor, one of the key characters of Cry of Fear. Huh? Who's that? Relax. I am not one of them. Who are you then? Why are you wearing a gas mask? Are you stupid or something? Do I look like I want to turn into one of them? One thing to know about Cry Fear is the voice acting. It's not polished or professional. At times a bit cheesy, there's something off about it, but it's in the same way the Silent Hill games could be, especially Silent Hill 2. This, uh, th this town, there's something wrong with it. It's kind of hard to explain, but... Is it dangerous? Maybe. And it's not just the fog, either. Okay, it's... I got it. I'll be careful. The best example is the scene with Simon and Sophie on the roof. It's an integral scene to the plot. It gets so close to crossing that line that it loses that uncomfortable feeling and becomes cheesy. It skirts that line, but never crosses. What results is a brilliant scene. It nails that otherworldly Silent Hill vibe. Although there are a couple of lines here that reminded me of the room. What the hell are you doing here? Oh, hi, Simon. Oh, hi, Mark. I'm just thinking. Thinking? Yeah, I've been doing a lot of that too. Well, I'm just sitting up here thinking, you know? And the scene goes on and on, and I don't mean that in a bad way. It goes on for an uncomfortable length of time, and then the realization of why Sophie is here. What? What do you mean? I know full well what I mean. Wait a sec, you... You mean all... No! No, no, no! It's about a six minute cutscene, and they nailed its execution, one of the more memorable moments in the game. One constant thorn or side throughout Cry Fear is the Saw Runner. We'll encounter him many times throughout. 
He doesn't come out of the blue either. There's a great buildup of dread when we hear the sounds of a chainsaw in the distance before our first encounter. Although he did bug out for me at one point in an amusing bit. One of the game's best stretches of contrasting relief with sheer terror is the college section. We have plenty of time to explore the college in peace, with a beautiful, haunting track in the background. Have a classic case of pick up a key item and have everything turn on its head. A staple of horror titles. Cry Fear wastes no time with having things descend into hell. The well-lit college is pitch black with enemies descending upon us. This is one of the most challenging stretches during my playthrough due to low health and the lack of healing items. And then we get another stretch of calm right after, with some great relaxing music. We're safe, if only but for a moment. <laughs> As much as I've been talking about the music, I feel that I've been underselling it as well. It's that good. Most horror game soundtracks can blur into one another, but everything here is distinct and memorable, on both sides of the coin. The tracks of relief and the tracks of terror. The next stretch at the subway station is the game's weakest. It's still great, but I find it goes on a bit too long. It has brilliant moments, like the section where the phone dies out and you need flares to navigate through these maze-like tunnels. And here we'll do a decent amount of backtracking, a staple of survival horror. Again, I commend them for making the choice of not having a map on hand and trusting you to know your way around. There's enough guidance from the environment that they trust the player to remember their way around. And making us go back to the apartments? I was not on board for that. I mean that in the best way possible. Not me ruling my eyes, but me dreading another visit. It's during these stretches we get a better idea of what's going on with Simon. Something isn't quite right with everything going on. The pieces begin to fall into place. We have some other world sections. Ones with heavy influence from Silent Hill, but stand on their own. He always goes back to the same place, day after day. Just watching it like it was yesterday. Despite the fact that it causes so much violence, anxiety, he insists on returning. He insists it's for therapeutic reasons, but I remain skeptical. After the annoying train escape, we're stripped of our equipment. All we have is a lantern and a stick as we navigate through the woods. This is a great section, although it gets over-reliant on haunted house-style scare tactics with the way bodies pop down from the trees. And afterwards, we end up in an abandoned mental hospital. Pretty much the last place I want to go right now. It makes the most of its tight environment to keep you on the edge of your seat the entire time. Although the whack-a-mole style boss fight with the doctor is pretty lame. What follows is one of the greatest senses of relief I've come across in the game. You can hear the birds chirping. Making our way outside, it's now daytime. Taking heavy influence from Silent Hill 2, we have a short rowing section across the lake. We're almost home. It's a brief period to give us time to reflect on where we've been. But we're not home yet. One of the game's best gotchas, we have stairs collapse underneath our feet, and now we have to make our way back to the surface. So close, yet so far. But afterwards, we finally arrive in Simon's neighborhood. It's one of the game's most surreal sections, considering everything we've gone through. The streets remain empty, save for the occasional enemy. The birds are chirping. It's tonal whiplash, but in the best way possible.
Before the final encounter, let's rewind a bit. What's really been going on here? A car did hit Simon. It crippled him, leaving him wheelchair bound. Already dealing with depression, this causes Simon to spiral down further. You can notice his struggles each time you heal. <sighs> A psychiatrist tells Simon to write a book about his thoughts as a form of therapy. Everything we've gone through is Simon confronting his trauma. All these monsters? Taking a good look at them, you can see how they represent his inner demons. Depending on a couple of choices you made in your playthrough, you can have four endings. In my playthrough, the ending stretch has us go after Simon as a wheelchair-bound Simon. It's not a pleasant encounter, and it's not meant to be. Handling the wheelchair is very awkward. Each ending has a long monologue from Simon, Thick Mary reading the letter in Silent Hill 2. Not quite to the level of acting, but still very good. Even though I'm still stuck in this wheelchair, but uh, I accept that now. I can never forgive myself for shooting those two officers though, but I have so many supportive people around me now, so I, I think I will be okay. I'm still not sure how I feel about these endings. They're dark, which doesn't surprise me, but they do veer into edgy territory. Something the game has skirted throughout, but never veered into. In three of the endings, Simon takes his own life along with the Doctor, Sophie, or both of them. In the ending I got, the quote-unquote best ending, Simon, in a state of psychosis, kills two police officers, but comes to terms with what he's done and seeks treatment. Killing a couple police officers does add more weight, but I feel it comes across as unnecessary. Simon coming to terms, being on the edge but turning back, was more than enough. It's not a deal breaker, but I felt it was a bit of a letdown of what came prior. It's wonderful in its execution throughout that few games can compete with. Long after finishing, I've been thinking about Cry of Fear. The monsters, the encounters, what they represent. So much is up to interpretation. And all these strengths add up to one of the best horror experiences I've come across. A small group coming together not for money, but a passion project. Like I said at the beginning, I feel like an outright thief having playing Cry of Fear with no price tag. With what they delivered, it's staggering. I hope one day to see what they put out next. They scrapped a Source and Unreal engine of Cry of Fear due to a lack of funding. It would cost too much to fund or take too long to make by themselves, according to their YouTube video with footage on the Source engine. There are plans for a new horror game, but nothing set in stone. I know Kickstarters can be hit or miss, but Team Psych Scholar would be a team that I would have confidence tossing some money their way if they went that direction. They've earned it by putting out a masterclass in survival horror with Cry of Fear. Thanks for watching.